what a joy it is to be in such a gathering, the energy, the sense of the Lord meeting us and preparing us for our present and future challenges, it's, it's palpable. Uh, and the, the relationship between CCCU and the NAE is robust and important and central as we labor together to be Christ followers in this particular moment. Uh, as Shirley mentioned, I used to minister for many years at Park Street Church, which is right at the corner of the Boston Common in downtown Boston. And when you're in that kind of situation, you see a lot of life. So one time when I was on my way to church, uh, a fight broke out on the Boston Common between a couple of drunken men. I don't know what overcame me, but I decided to intervene. So I stepped in the middle and tried to calm the situation down because I knew someone was going to get hurt. Then it dawned on me, I was probably that someone that was going to get hurt. So I tried to channel my best Yoda. You will stop fighting. You will put down that can of beer. And amazingly, this didn't work. In fact, a, a, a crowd started gathering around, chanting, fight, fight, fight. The situation was not good. As I continued to calm the situation down, or at least try to, really what happened was the drunken combatants lost interest and the crowds dispersed. And as I continued to walk toward the church, I was reminded, this is why we're here. This should not be. Not only the fighting and the hatred and the anger represented, but the glee that bystanders had. This should not be. That experience was coupled with another experience that I had in downtown Boston around that time. And that was the opportunity to see Les Mis. Now, if you've read the book or have seen the musical, you know this is a magnificent story. Epic revolution, budding romance. And then at the heart of it, the redemption of Jean Valjean. Someone who had experienced injustice and inhumanity and the potential loss of his identity in the darkness and the brokenness of the world. Yet it was the witness of a faithful priest that put him on a different path of redemption. And he, he struggled between brokenness and beauty. And there's a particular moment uh, in the musical, the night before a revolution, when Jean Valjean discovers that the budding lover of his daughter, Marius, was about to join the battlefield. And in a song that I would have to mark as one of the most earnest, heartfelt performances, he sings a prayer that God would deliver Marius. As that song concluded, there was a hush that came over the audience. And I witnessed something that I had never seen before. I have seen applause given. I have seen a standing ovation at end of performances. But I've never seen a musical stop right in the middle. Everyone standing up and applauding. But it wasn't raucous. The applause was almost reverent, and the show just stopped. Because they're peeking into the moments of our life was beauty, or at least the yearning for beauty. What we do as followers of Jesus is we live and navigate between brokenness and beauty. What we do 
in our college campuses and universities is we allow a bit of the eternal purpose of God to pierce the veil of our temporal moment and to draw us closer to his kingdom purposes. I want to turn our attention to a passage that speaks to that, of beauty in the midst of brokenness, from Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah 2, verses 1 through 5. This is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of mountains. It will be exalted above the hills. All the nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. You know, when I became a Christian, I learned what I was saved from, saved from sin, saved from separation from God, from the dominion of Satan. But much of the Christian life has been a journey of learning what I've been saved for. What are we saved to do in this world and in the world to come? Amid chaos, we are called to participate in God's renewal of all things. Now, unlike Isaiah, I am not a prophet but I'm going to make a prophecy. I prophesy that you have either come out of, are in, or will soon enter into a difficult time. <laughs> Pretty safe prophecy. And in those difficult times, we have to fight the natural instinct for self-preservation, for vindictiveness. Now, Isaiah lived in turbulent times. We want to say that we have, we have lived through unprecedented years. It feels unprecedented to us. But in the scope of God's work in this world, God's people have actually faced a lot worse. Admittedly, there were moments of economic prosperity, political stability for ancient Israel, but these really were often islands of peace within an ocean of chaos. And during the time of the writing of Isaiah, the new Assyrian Empire was terrorizing and engulfing the nations, including Israel and Judah. And with the unprecedented pressure, Judah had a front row seat to the downward political spiral of the northern kingdom of Israel. Almost with dizzying, dizzying rapidity in 2 Kings 15, we, we learned that Shalom had assassinated Zechariah and succeeded him as king. Then Menahem assassinated Shalom and succeeded him as king. And okay, Menahem lived his life, but his son was assassinated by Pekah, who in turn was assassinated by Hoshea, the last king of Israel. We think we have encountered political turmoil. And not only did Isaiah have a front row seat to this, the demise and deportation of the northern kingdom, they lived it. They lived it. The southern kingdom itself experienced the wrath of the Assyrians. If you go to the British Museum in London, you can see the actual threat that Judah experienced. Massive stone reliefs recovered from the palace of Sennacherib. And that, that relief depicts the battering rams, the long spears, the flaming arrows, and their soldiers impaled naked on long spears and hoisted up like flags of warning. How do you respond to such chaos? Where is God in this moment? 
Is there any beauty in brokenness? Maybe it's in the people of God. Well, Isaiah points out that the eternal, external chaos was matched by internal corruption. And so the context of chapter one, from, uh, of chapter one to, into chapter two is one of a long prophetic litany of the public sins of Israel. Worship without ex, uh, ethics that God despised, social violence, political corruption, a judicial system that was broken and did not defend the cause of the poor, the widow, the oppressed. Okay, is there any hope? And into this tumultuous time, God gives Isaiah a vision for the people. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. Isaiah lived in a generationally defining moment for the people of God. And he received a vision that transcends the generations. A reminder of God's kingship in the midst of chaos and complexity. A vision for us in our moment. And note, this is a vision of a multinational work of God that came amid war, persecution, and the existential threat of God's work in this world. It came in a moment of desperate need when the internal resources of God's people seemed as bad and as depleted as the external trials. And this is a vision that defied every human instinct for self-preservation. The nations were, in fact, streaming to Israel and Jerusalem to destroy them. And God was asking for the doors to be open, for their hostility to be responded by our hospitality. What an extraordinary call. Speaks to the supernatural nature of this vision. Notice that all, all nations will stream up to this mountain. Streams don't go up, they go down. The natural gravity of chaos is being combated by the supernatural work of grace. And the nations are going upstream to God. And the question is, will we participate? Will we join in God's work of renewing? It is on top of a mountain. Now, now we are embodied creatures. A, a, a study in Science uh, Magazine Journal reported the incidental interaction between physical objects and how that shapes our judgment. Resumes that were put on heavier clipboards, according to this study, were judged to be more substantial. <laughs> Same resume, light, heavy clipboards change the perception. Negotiators that sat in softer chairs versus harder chairs drove softer bargains. For those of you in fundraising, keep that in mind. <laughs> Why on top of a mountain? Because it reminds us, it, it, we are wired to look up to the mountain and to see transcendence, God's kingship. For this reason, the Jerusalem temple was put on top of a mountain to be a physical and spiritual GPS system for ancient Israel. It, it, literally, it dominated the landscape of Jerusalem. If you wanted to know where to go, you kind of lost your bearings, you found, well, okay, there's a temple, yeah, make a right turn here, left turn there, and you get to Jacob's house. But it was a spiritual GPS. It was a point of reorientation, not just physically, but theologically. And what would you discover in that reorientation? 
What journey, what architectural journey would you take? Well, you would get to the temple and on the outside there was the, the paraphernalia of forgiveness. The great altar where the sacrifices are given to remind us of our fundamental need of redemption and the offer of that redemption through the Lamb and ultimately the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. But that was just the beginning of that theological journey. From there you would enter into the holy area and there on the walls you would have images of pomegranates and palm trees and cherubim, a reminder of Eden. That the work of redemption, the forgiveness of sins, was just the beginning of the Christian journey. What we are saved from. But what are we saved for? You enter into the holy area and we are saved for the recreation, the redemption, the renewal of all things. Between the first Edom and the ultimate Eden in the new kingdom. The new heavens and the new earth. And then you get into the holy of holies in an architectural structure that was unique in the ancient world. A perfect cube, 30 feet by 30 feet by 30 feet. Why that structure? Architects today have discovered and, and really understood the nature of perfect cubes. You know, when you go into a room, you generally know how it should be oriented. If I was speaking from that corner, you would sense something really odd and uncomfortable about that. It's, rooms are not organized that way. When you enter into a perfect cube, you lose all sense of spatial orientation. You don't know which direction is up or down. And this was intentional. It was an invitation to enter into the redemptive experience of forgiveness, to recreation, commission, of making all things new, and to lose ourselves in the wonder of who God is. Absolutely immersed in his transcendence, mercy, love. What, what you do is so incredibly important. You have these years with students where you invite them on that journey to understand redemption better, to know it more deeply in a broken world, to join together in every endeavor that God would give to humanity in the redemption and renewal of all things. But not simply as a humanistic do-gooding attempt, ultimately to lose ourselves in the wonder of who God is. something Christian colleges are uniquely able to offer. The context of the great why of what we learn. And here is a, a vision not just simply of individual transformation, but institutional transformation. We go up to the temple in order to go out into the world to be agents of a wise and welcoming justice. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. Of course, scripture speaks of judgment as judgment against sin, but here judgment is not judgment against sin. It's not retribution, it is restoration, it is reconciliation. The law that goes out from Zion is not simply a bunch of rules. It includes the story of redemption, of creation, fall, deliverance found in Genesis and Exodus. In Deuteronomy, we actually hear the reason that the law is given. Keep them and do them, these regulations, for they will become your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. Who then will hear all these statutes and will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteousness, righteous as this law that I've set before you today? There was actually a missional purpose for the law. The way that Israel's society was ordered was to be an enticement, a witness, an apologetic for God's presence in the world that would draw the nations to it. 
the ways that we pursue education, order the Christian community, should be an apologetic for the ways that God would seek to redeem this world. Is the city in which your school resides wiser because of your presence? Is it more able to sense the way that this college is ordered, this community of people is ordered, is so compelling that we have something to learn? And this encompasses the work of transformation in the domains of life. He will judge between the nations and will settle their disputes. He will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. The good news of Jesus ultimately contributes not just to personal, but to public transform transformation as well. The judicial system is transformed. The economic system is transformed, plowshares and pruning hooks for an agrarian society would represent economic flourishing, the dignity of work as each family had a parcel of land given to them by God. And then there was the social cohesion, the means and manners and mentality of war dispensed. The world longs for such beauty to pierce brokenness. James Chong from uh, InterVarsity, Vice President of Strategic Innovation, uh, has written and given presentations on generational shifts and the impact on gospel presentations. We all have questions that we ask about life, but it seems that each generation has a gateway question, a leading question that leads to the other questions. For boomers, the question typically is, what is true? And hence, the boomer generation resonated deeply with the apologetics movement. Probably every boomer has read evidence that demands a verdict. The Gen Xers, my generation, our question is, what is real? That's why every Gen X pastor has been trained to open up with a personal illustration. Because we want to establish authentic, real connection. Millennials, their question is, what is good? What is good? And their commitments to justice, to the good, is instinctual. Gen Zers. Those in college now and coming up, their question is, what is beautiful? In a world of ugly, can we find beauty? Every one of us asks all those questions. But each of us and each generation seems to have a gateway question. What does it look like to have a form of faith that sends out beautiful followers of Jesus into this world. As the president of the National Association of Evangelicals, when I stepped into the position two years ago, I was often asked the question, are you gonna fix this? <laughs> or are you gonna drop the name evangelical? Or here's a list of complaints. I almost got to the point of saying, Hello, I'm the president of the National Association of Evangelicals, and I'm sorry. Whatever, whatever it is that you're thinking. <laughs> but I don't want to give up the term evangelical. Because just before I took up my role, I had the opportunity to be a part of a delegation to attend the World Evangelical Alliance in Jakarta, Indonesia where 800 delegates from 90 different countries were gathered. I did not always understand every syllable that was sung or spoken, but I understood the spirit, and I joined in it. There was a panel discussion in one of the plenary sessions where <coughs> representatives from Africa and Asia and, and Europe and South America were, were discussing what was going on in America. 
I wanted to turn my name tag over so that no one would be able to see where I was from. But as the discussion unfolded, it really resulted in a plea. We need you as partners in this work. I had a lot to think about, and on the bus ride back from the convention center to the hotel, you know, I, I wanted a kind of a little bit of a release emotionally, so I headed to the back of the bus, you know, because I needed to find where the fun evangelicals were. And they were always at the back of the bus. <laughs> and there they were. There was a lot of laughter. Like, oh, you know, I wonder what delegation they are. And as I introduced myself to them and they to me, I discovered that they were delegates, Palestinian followers of Jesus with Jewish Israeli, Israeli followers of Jesus. Huh, and I think about the complexity of that relationship. And there they were, laughing, loving, learning with each other, and seeking to live faithfully in whatever challenge God would put before them in the years to come. I'm so grateful to be a part of a global community, hundreds of millions of people faithfully following Jesus. How American it would be just to jettison a term because it's inconvenient to us. I want to be partners with what God is doing throughout the world. And I'm so grateful, and I pray diligently that in an ocean of chaos, your campuses would be places of beauty. The mountain of the Lord, where the nations will be drawn. Let's pray. God, we do have difficult days, but we have a magnificent Savior. And you have given us this moment in which to live and learn and serve you. Make us faithful. And in turbulent times, it amidst chaos, complexity, help us to submit to your kingship and your purposes. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.